Before we go into that, I would want to share with you uh, for the next 10 minutes something brief on moving the nutrition agenda for Africa and for Africa's development. I want to applaud all the researchers, all the international organizations, and all the civil societies that are championing the nutrition agenda in Africa. We don't take lightly your contributions. You are doing an excellent job in trying to help Africa move up with its continental partners. And for presentations that have happened over the three days, we clearly have seen the work and the great effort that have come from other areas. I want to announce to you that Africa is rising. And I'll tell you why that is so uh, shortly. But before I go into that, in the forefront of moving the nutrition agenda for African development, we are what we call the African Nutrition Society. This is an opportunity for all nutritionists or those working in the area of nutrition to come on board, that we can form coalitions, that we can work together in partnership, that we can all have a belonging to a society, an organization, where we can share our experiences. And so the African Nutrition Society was formed for you. We've been fortunate enough to have very, various leaders and uh, trustees from across the continent, Most, some of who are on this platform right now, listening to me. And currently, uh, Professor Amos La is the president of the African Nutrition Society. His term is almost at its tail end, and in the next couple of months, we'll have a new president. But our desire is to work closely with all nutritionists, people working in the area of nutrition, to move the nutrition agenda forward and to join hands with this wonderful, wonderful team of researchers around the world so that we will be able to partner with you to see how best we can move uh, the nutrition agenda in country across the 54 countries or uh, 55 countries in, in Africa. Now, alongside the African Nutrition Society is what we call the Federation of African Nutrition Societies. And these are a collection of nutrition societies from across the countries. So for example, Nigeria has the Nigerian Nutrition Society. Ethiopia has the Ethiopian Nutrition Society. And so do we have other countries that have formed the Nutrition Society. So for Africa, we have about potentially 54 nutrition societies. Whereas with the African Nutrition Societies, you have a vote in deciding how we move the nutrition agenda across Africa. And so your vote matters. Now, these two organizations feed into what we call the International Union of Nutritional Sciences that oversees the nutrition agenda across the globe. You cannot be a member of the IUNS, the International Union of Nutritional Sciences. You cannot be a member of the FANUS, Federation of African Nutrition Societies, but you can be a member of the African Nutrition Society. And as a member of the African Nutrition Society, your voice can be heard at the FANUS meetings or at the IUNS level. Now, if your country does not have a nutrition society, the African Nutrition Society is happy to partner with you so that you can be the catalyst in forming a nutrition society in your country. So this is what we do in trying to move the nutrition agenda across Africa. Now, having said this, I would want to announce to you that it is often said that Africa is a dark country, a continent. But you see, of the 54, 55 different countries, Africa is rich of natural resources. Africa 
is rich of its food resources. Africa has not only got the potential, but it's also got the richness to match any other country in the world. The continent has about 60% of the arable land resource of the world's largest, of the world's arable land resource. What it means is that if you look at 100% of the world's arable land, Africa has 60 of those. And so as nutritionists, as you hear my voice, how can we partner and work together to bring out the potential of Africa? That is my clarion call to you. And having said that, I would want us to try hard for countries that have not got food-based dietary guidelines. This is the opportunity for us to formulate food-based dietary guidelines to promote effective food choices in all countries. It is sad to say that only about seven, six or seven countries in Africa have got food-based dietary guidelines. And I know Ghana is working hard to come up with its own food-based dietary guidelines led by uh, Professor Brayton Aite and, and, and his team. But we know also that Ethiopia is also at the verge of coming up with these food-based dietary guidelines. How can you, as a nutritionist, how can you, interested in nutrition, work with your fellow nutritionists to come up with food-based dietary guidelines? How can we increase the quantity and the quality of available data of what people actually eat? There are people that are groping in darkness. There are people that are waiting for you to be able to come up with the data, the relevant knowledge. And that is why uh, Amanda's presentation, uh, 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 Sally's presentation, Stephanie's presentations are very important. The research work that is being done all uh, across Africa, in Europe, and across the world is very relevant for us to be able to dig into. It is important that African leaders make policies which regulate product formulation, labeling, advertising, promotion, and tax ultra-processed foods. That must be a high priority. How do we break down barriers that have been associated with our long-standing division of jurisdictional responsibilities within many governments? We find a lot of organizations, a lot of departments, a lot of uh, institutions working in silos. But it is high time we began to see the Minister of Agriculture working with the Minister of Health, working with the Minister of Social Protection and Commerce. That is the only way that Africa can move out of its doldrums and begin to work effectively and promote the health that we need. Accountability at all levels is my clarion call to action. And I want to commend you for the way that you are doing, but I also want to call upon you that let us try in every little way to improve accountability at all levels. You and I, the onus is upon us to make Africa great again. Africa not only has the potential, Africa has what it takes to rise up and be counted. And I'm relying on you. As I look into your face, as I look into the camera, my plea to you is that get off and see what you can do. How can you partner with your brother or sister, with somebody else who is a nutritionist, and say, enough is enough? There is something that you and I can do within our little corner to try and move the nutrition agenda for African development. This, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, is my clear call to you. Let us make a difference once we have life. Having said that, I now want to move straight to the mandate I was given. And the mandate I was given is to look at the wonderful presentations that have been made over the course of the three days. The food environment research priorities for Africa. These have been suggestions 
from the delegates that listened in, that presented, and I want to share some with you, and I'm hopeful that you would also take this opportunity to, to share some of what you think are the research priorities for Africa. Now, we have the research to research the broader food environment, looking at the physical and the macro levels, as well as identify pathways of the factors that influence dietary behaviors. There is also this suggestion that we should explore and evaluate existing interventions to promote healthy diets in a way that goes beyond what works, but also identify for whom it works and in what context, especially women and adolescents. That is very important. We must make every effort to look at approaches in understanding lived experiences of the food environment. Then there are other priority areas. What are the community priorities for their local food environment and how can public private partnerships best serve these needs? Another says, how can we communities ensure access to safe, healthy, convenient foods and beverages and limit reliance on low cost on healthy processed foods, especially for families who have limited time for food preparation. And we see that clearly in the urban areas where people have to leave their homes as early as 5 a.m., 4 a.m. sometimes, and they wake up their children because they want to be the traffic so that they can get to work early. And in so doing, they are not able to have breakfast. And so would have to rely on breakfast by the roadside or restaurants, cheap restaurants, where they are served on healthy processed foods. What is that doing to families? Another question is, what innovations are most promising to stimulate demand for sustainable diets? Again, we look at the double duty actions tackling the full spectrum of nutrition challenges, including undernutrition, overweight, obesity, and nutrition-related non-communicable diseases. Development, testing, and the validation of standardized instruments and matrix to profile our food environment. There was also the association between food environment, exposure, dietary, nutrition, and healthy outcomes. We have the robust longitudinal and experimental studies at multiple scales to assess the impact of intervention on diets, nutrition status, and health outcomes. The list goes on and on. We have measurement of diet quality and research linking diet quality to nutrition outcomes, including refinement, and validation of tools to measure diet quality. We also have research on food systems, interventions and approaches are successful in improving nutrition in the lower middle income countries. And that is very important. I couldn't agree anymore with you. The development of innovative interventions and pilot studies to evaluate the efficacy of interventions and policy to intervene in food systems. There has to be innovative approaches to improve availability and affordability of healthy diets. The need to increase agricultural productivity, availability and affordability of nutrient dense foods, such as the animal source foods, legumes, fruits, and vegetables and foods that are rich in fiber. Research on new technology, including labor saving agriculture technology and innovation in farm management practices. We need to conduct research in these areas. Then we can look at the traditional foods for Africa, particularly with the risk and the value addition. 
we have the nutrition literacy and the need to link local diets and the NCDs. Very important. The need to develop and validate innovative methods to capture the consumption of ultra-processed foods. We need to measure advertising and exposure to unhealthy foods in the public and school environment. And I know Amos uh, is leading a team of researchers to, to look at this. Assess the effect of food taxes and subsidies on triple bedding of malnutrition. How to transform the food system to promote healthy diets, affordability, access, and availability of healthy diets? How do we improve productivity of our healthy diets? And what are the key integrated policy packages most conducive to improved food environment? How can we nudge consumers towards healthier diets across the range of commercial and institutional channel? How can we best align food environment research with policy transformations? So you see, my esteemed colleagues, we have captured these from various presentations throughout these past three days. But nonetheless, you have additional suggestions and deliberations you would want to share with us. And so the platform is open and I would want to invite you to share in addition to what I have readily gone through, what you think are the research priorities for Africa, looking at the food environment presentations that have been made, that you would want to suggest that the FEN team can take on board going forward. 